Hi everyone, the video you are about to watch was a patient and community webinar hosted by our St. Michael's Family Health Team Green Team on September 27th. My name is Sarah Nestico and I am the Clinical Nurse Specialist at the St. Michael's Family Health Team and also the co-lead of the Green Team. We had a few technical difficulties and missed the instruction part of our presentation, which included introducing our team and a wonderful land acknowledgement. The webinar was part of a three-part series looking at climate change in the context of health. This session was focused on plant-rich diets. In a few moments, you will hear from our presenters, which include Melinda Glassford and Lisa Liu, both dietitians with our family health team, Dr. Brian McKenna, a family doctor at the Hamilton Family Health Team, and Dr. Katie Dorman, a family doctor with the St. Michael's Family Health Team. The topics discussed included climate change and its impact on health, introduction to plant-rich diets, how to incorporate plant-rich diets into your life and included local resources people can access in the community. We hope you enjoy. Global warming and extreme uh, climate like drought, storms and floods. Examples of greenhouse gases include carbon dioxide, which is produced from driving cars and electricity, heating our homes, hot water, and also methane gas, which is from landfills, livestock and coal mining. Carbon footprint is, oh, can we go back? Sorry. Carbon footprint is the total greenhouse gas emissions caused by an individual, organization, event, or product, either directly or indirectly. In, in the resources at the end um, of the presentation, Katie's going to be sharing, you'll see a link for you to calculate your carbon footprint. Um, it's by Climate Hero, and it really asks about three areas of your um, life, so home, travel and your diet so you can actually see what your actual impact is on um, your carbon footprint. Thank you. Next slide. So why should we care? Climate change affects the essential ingredients of good health, clean air, safe drinking water, nutritious food supply. The World Health Organization is predicting that between the years 2030 and 2050, climate change is expected to cause approximately 250,000 additional deaths per year from malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea, and heat stress. Oh, next slide. So for the last five years, we're the hottest years in centuries. If we have just two degrees Celsius warming globally by the year 2100, it will have disastrous effects on many of the Earth's systems. And currently, unfortunately, we're on track to exceed that two degrees. They're predicting also by the year 2050, sea levels are expected to rise. Sea levels have two main causes for rising. One is global warming, causing added water to the oceans from melting ice sheets, glaciers, and the polar ice cap. The other reason is that the sea water is actually expanding due to the increase in global temperature, so taking up more space in the existing ocean basins, impacting people living on coastal areas. Next slide. So what is the impact of food systems on climate change? Food accounts for nearly a third of our global emissions. Meat products have a larger carbon footprint per calorie than grain or vegetable products. Next slide. We hear a lot about beef and that's because cows emit methane gas, which we know is a greenhouse gas from burping when they eat and breathe, and this gas is also released in manure. Fertilizers that are used to grow cattle, feed, release nitrous oxide, oxide, a greenhouse gas that's 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Beef's greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram are 7.2 times greater than those of chicken. Next slide. This slide shows by foods, it's a little bit hard to see, but the impact of global warming um, by emissions of carbon dioxide by weight. And what you can see on the right hand side is that lamb and beef are the highest um, emissions of carbon dioxide produced with through food production, so feed, water and waste, and food consumption, processing, refrigeration, cooking, and waste. And what you can see on the left hand side is that vegetables and fruits from the field, cereals, legumes, and pulses have the lowest 
emissions of carbon dioxide by weight. Next slide. So what can you do? Reduce your intake of animal foods and replace with plant foods. Eat less red meat like beef and lamb and be mindful of food waste. Next slide. Even small changes can make a difference. You can cut your dietary carbon footprint by 50% by replacing beef with chicken or fish, eating less meat each week, for example, meatless Mondays. If you're able to really reduce your animal proteins by completely replacing them with plant proteins, you can reduce your carbon footprint by 95%. Pretty significant change. Next slide. I'm going to turn it over to Lisa to talk about what is a plant-rich diet. Thank you, Melinda. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to go into a bit of detail around what does a plant-rich diet look like. And you've probably heard a couple of different phrases. There are a variety of different types of plant-rich diets. However, the main focus is on reducing or completely avoiding the intake of animal foods. These include meat, poultry, fish, and milk products. Next slide. There are a couple of different varieties of plant-rich diets. Some you may have been familiar with and some might be a newer term. We'll just go over a couple of these examples. Lacto-ovo vegetarian diet means that one would be eating eggs and milk products, but excludes meat. Pescatarian diet means that one is able to eat fish or seafood, but no other meat products. A vegan diet means that one does not eat any meat products or byproducts of any animals. And a new term that you may not be familiar with is called flexitarian or semi-vegetarian. And this means that one would primarily most of the time consume a plant-rich diet and occasionally eats meat and fish. And we will use the term plant-rich or vegetarian together. Next slide, please. We know of a lot of health benefits associated with eating a plant-rich diet. And a lot of the focus and the research Dr. McKenna will go through is really looking at certain ingredients and components in plant-rich diets. Some of these nutrients include a diet high in fiber, a diet in healthy fats. And we know that plant-rich diets can lower the risk of many diseases, such as heart disease or cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and some cancers. Plant-rich diets tend to be higher in whole grain foods, pulses, beans, and legumes, fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, and soy-rich foods. And many of those foods are also rich in dietary fiber. Plant-rich diets also lower the risk factors for many chronic diseases. And some of these risk factors include having high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and high blood sugars. Next slide. So when we think about replacing some animal foods with plant foods, some of these pictures describe some common items that you might see in the grocery store. And just to give you some examples of what it would, what it would take to replace some animal foods with plant-based foods. So for example, you might be familiar with a typical hamburger or hot dog, which is usually made of beef or uh, chicken or pork. And instead we could replace it with a veggie burger or veggie dog, which is often made of soy, bean, peas, or beans. We could replace a uh, typical meat soup, like chicken noodle soup or a type of beef stew. And instead we would consider eating a bean soup, like chickpea soup or lentil soup. Instead of having cow's milk as a beverage or in our cereal, we could consider having soy milk and other plant-based milks like almond milk or oat milk. Instead of having a deli meat sandwich, we would consider having a sandwich made with nut butters, such as peanut butter, almond butter, cashew butter. And instead of having typical ground beef tacos, we would consider having bean or legume tacos instead. Next slide, please. There are many different resources and information that you can find online that describe some examples of what it would take to, to uh, consume a plant-based diet. And we will include in our resources section a great resource that uh, you can click on in the link, and it describes for you a seven-day plant-based meal 
that breaks down the nutritional components of that type of meal um, and to show that you can still eat a very balanced diet by including a variety of plant-rich foods. Next slide, please. So what does a plant-rich diet look like? So we just wanted to use a few examples, including three meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, just to give some ideas on how does this, how can this be easy, simple, but tasty at the same time. So looking on the left-hand side, first we start with some breakfast options. So some examples we've listed include having oatmeal with nuts and berries, perhaps having a tofu scramble instead of having an egg, scrambled eggs. We can have cereal with soy milk instead of having cereal with cow's milk. And we can have a slice of whole grain toast with some nut butter instead of a whole grain slice of toast with uh, butter. For lunch, some great ideas include having a bean salad with a variety of lentils, chickpeas, and black beans. Having a tofu curry instead of having a meat curry like a chicken curry or a fish curry. And we can also have a wrap, sometimes named quesadilla, that usually involves melted cheese and often contains chicken, but we can replace that with some black beans and have a delicious uh, lunch option. For dinner, on the right-hand side, some options include having a tofu stir-fry, which involves including tofu and a variety of different vegetables on a, on a bed of rice or noodles, instead of having a chicken stir-fry or a beef stir-fry. We can also have a variety of different curries and stews. So instead of having a meat stew, like a beef stew or a fish stew, we could have a lentil stew or a chickpea stew. Next slide, please. There are a lot more benefits aside from health benefits. And one major one is helping to cut the cost of grocery bills. And we know with the rise in inflation and the high cost of food, this is something really important that will impact everyone. Next slide, please. Oh, you can skip to the next slide. So for example, just using two typical dishes that you might be familiar with, one is an example is a chili dish. Often it's made on the left-hand side with some type of ground meat, beans, and a variety of vegetables and a tomato-based broth. And on the right-hand side is an example of a chicken curry. Uh, often can have uh, some type of meat, some potatoes, and a variety of vegetables. And if we're looking at trying to replace it with plant-rich options, we can swap out the package of ground meat for two cans of black beans. And when we're looking at the curry, we can swap out one package of chicken breasts for two cans of lentils or chickpeas. Next slide. And looking at the cost breakdown, you can see here, if we swap out animal foods for plant-rich foods, we can save anywhere between seven to eight dollars off our grocery bill per meal, which is very significant if we look at the rising cost of food. Next slide, please. Next, I'm going to go into some brief details around some of the nutrients that we want to focus on when we're considering including plant-rich diets. The first nutrient that we talk about is protein. And protein is a nutrient that helps to build and maintain our muscle, and very important throughout the years as we age. You can get more than enough protein by following a plant-rich diet. And some of the sources of plant-rich proteins as uh, shown in the pictures include beans, lentils, soy-based foods like tofu or tempeh, and nuts and seeds and nut butters. Next slide, please. Iron. Iron is a mineral that delivers oxygen to the body. Having low, le having low levels of iron can make you feel tired and have low energy. Heme iron is a term that means iron that is found in animal foods, and these are absorbed very well. Non-heme iron is iron that is found in plant-based foods, and these are not absorbed as well. However, if we eat plant-rich foods that have iron together with foods that have vitamin C, that can help us to increase the absorption of the iron. Some examples of plant-rich foods that have iron include beans, lentils, nuts and seeds, soy products, and some leafy green vegetables. 
And just like the picture below, it's showing a handful of almonds. And if we include a few slices of oranges, which are rich in vitamin C, that would help to increase the absorption of iron from the almonds. Next slide, please. Calcium. Calcium is a mineral that's important for healthy bones and teeth. Some sources of plant-rich calcium include tofu or soy products, beans, almonds, and leafy green vegetables like spinach and kale. A really good example of a good source of calcium is soy milk. Next slide. Vitamin B12. So vitamin B12 is a vitamin that's required for proper red blood cell production and in the development of our nervous systems. Vitamin B12 is found naturally in animal foods, so meat, chicken, fish, seafood, milk products, and eggs. Some plant-rich foods are fortified with vitamin B12, meaning the food companies have added it in in the processing. And some of these foods include soy milk, nutritional yeast, some cereals, and some veggie meat products. Following a strict plant-rich diet, another term may be called vegan diet, may require taking a vitamin B12 supplement. And you can talk to your doctor or dietitian for more details. Next slide. And now we're gonna turn it over to Melinda, who's gonna finish our presentation with looking at small little ways that we all can make an impact on creating some positive impact on climate change. And I just wanna, before I go forward, just uh, to thank you for the great questions in the chat. I'm not sure of all of the answers, but uh, certainly um, I've tried to answer some of them. Um, so other ways that you can reduce your impact on climate change. So planning ahead, making a grocery list, checking best before dates, freezing food, using leftovers, bringing reusable grocery bags or produce bags can also save you money because now you're gonna have to buy them. Um, buying produce with less packaging. So buying loose spinach instead of boxed. Next slide. So get creative, use it all. So keeping skins on potatoes, carrots, fruit, using veggie scraps for soup stock, thinking about composting some of your food scraps. And you can also use the um, zest of lemons and oranges in salad dressings and in baked goods or on some foods. Next slide. <clears throat> Shopping local has a big benefit for the planet. It takes less resources to transport and store food and often less packaging. So it can um, really have a reduction on your overall carbon footprint. Next slide. So what about eating foods in season? So when you eat foods in season, they, the foods tend to be in good supply. Um, often there's sales at the grocery store and you're supporting some of our local farmers. Um, what's in season, so we're heading into fall, apples, leeks, and cranberries. And when we head into winter, it's gonna be some of those root vegetables. So rutabaga, squash, sweet potatoes. In the spring, it's typically greenhouse vegetables. So peppers, also radishes and spinach. And in the summer, strawberries, tomatoes, and zucchini. Next slide. This is a resource from Foodland Ontario, and we've included it in the resource for you. And it just lists uh, vegetables, common vegetables and fruits, and their availability um, when they are in season. So you can use this as a resource as well. Next slide. So in summary, even small changes can make a difference. Plant-rich diets may have benefits reducing your carbon footprint, being more cost-effective, can reduce the risk of many chronic diseases, can help to reduce food waste, and shopping local and in season. These can all really have a big impact on the climate. And I think my last slide, our last slide. Yep. So I'm gonna turn it over to Brian. Brian's gonna take us um, through the next part that's um, more, a little bit more in depth of what we talked about just now. Thanks so much. 
Great, thank you so much, Melinda and Lisa, for providing that really excellent overview and how we can um, make these changes in our life and, and, and why they're important. So um, you really provided some practical uh, ways to embed this into our daily routines. So I will hand this over now to Dr. Brian McKenna, who's gonna share some more details on the health benefits of plant-rich diets, um, specifically highlighting um, the benefits for a chronic different chronic illnesses and um, and then also highlighting more actions that you can take to uh, do this in your day-to-day -day life. So over to you, Brian. Thanks very much, Sarah. Really appreciate it. And good evening, everyone. Uh, a big thanks to the green team from Unity for having me this evening. Um, I, as mentioned, will be diving into um, sort of the physiologic or bodily benefits of, of eating this way um, in a way that really conveys that low carbon healthcare ultimately is the kind of healthcare that, you know, we want the kind leads to the kind of health outcomes um, that we really want for ourselves and for our loved ones. So it's great to be here. Next slide, please. So again, just that sense that, you know, high quality healthcare really is low carbon care and that, the, you know, there is a real sort of symbiotic relationship between how we need to care for our own bodies and how we need to care for the planet we live in. And I'll, I'll get into the clinical sort of meat of that, pardon the expression, in a minute. Next slide, please. So one of the big things, and I think, you know, I say this to my McMaster medical students quite often, I think one of the reasons people choose primary care over some of the specialties um, is because there's this real fun in moving upstream. And one of the things that we really try to do in primary care is, you know, intervene in a way that reduces people's downstream need for medical care. And, and I think this slide captures that really well, you know, with one study estimating that the savings in healthcare expense from implementing a, a plant-rich diet globally could result in 21 trillion US dollars annually in terms of reduction in environmental harm, um, as well as 234 billion US dollars annually by 2050 due to decreased emissions from plant production as well as health benefits. So one of the things we need to think about is, you know, not only not only is there significant negative impact on the planet from production of food, on certain types of food that we want to avoid, particularly animal-based food, but the medical system and medical care in and of itself um, has, has a pretty negative impact on the planet. Next slide, please. So we really do want to sort of, um, you know, um, reduce the amount of downstream medical care that our patients need. This is one, this is a quick slide just to convey that worldwide, there does seem to be a real interest across populations. This slide reflects that people are searching with more and more frequency, things like vegan diets and plant-rich diets. Next slide, please. Next slide. So again, quality care, here we go. Next slide, please. So the typical Western diet, so what is that? It's high intake of animal food, processed food, lots of saturated fats and added sugars, and typically a relatively lower intake of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and legumes. This typical Western diet is linked with much higher morbidity. So it is making us sick. It is killing us early. Um, and, and it's resulting in more years of disease and disability um, than would be the case if we ate sort of the plant-rich way that was presented by Melinda and Lisa earlier. And again, this, this typical Western diet relies heavily on non-renewable resources and unsustainable practices. Next slide, please. So benefits of a plant-rich diet, there's a lot of sort of medical jargon on this slide, but just to really break it down for you, what it's showing on the left is subtypes, food subcategories of the plant-rich diet and the respective effects that these food subtypes have on hemoglobin A1C, which is our average 60 to 90 day blood sugar, the rates of cardiovascular disease. So again, diseases of, of the heart and the blood vessels. So leading cause of, of heart attack and stroke. And then, and then other things sort of related to what we would consider metabolic syndrome. So how heavy are you? How high is your cholesterol? How high is your blood pressure? Implementing a plant-rich way of eating improves all of this. Next slide, please. So again, a Mediterranean diet, it's really good. And I find that it helps with patients and hopefully it helps you to understand what, 
what some of the core examples of plant-rich eating are. Mediterranean diet, DASH diet, these are two sort of really concrete examples of, of the types of plant-rich eating patterns that we're talking about. And what we're talking about is a pyramid. So I really want to emphasize that we're talking about progress, not perfection. We're talking about a general approach, but, but not absolute sort of, you know, hard and fast rules. We're talking about most of what you eat should grow from the ground, should come from plants, but that there still is sort of this pyramid pyramid effect that, that will involve bits of animal here and there. So it's about ratios. Next slide, please. So overall health benefits. So studies have shown that adherence or following a Mediterranean diet can reduce overall mortality by 8%. And remember, if we could produce a pill that could do that, Big Pharma would be all over it. We're talking about improvements in weight status, reduction in inflammation, as well as improved energy metabolism. And the inflammation is a big one because, you know, there's more and more sort of understanding that many of the diseases that we deal with on a regular basis, from heart disease to autoimmune disease to heart attacks, likely results from sort of a pretty major burden of inflammation. So if this typical Western diet that we're eating makes us more inflamed, it's going to cause all sorts of problems replacing 3% of your caloric intake from meat protein with plant protein is said to be able to decrease your overall mortality by up to 10%. Plant-rich diets as part of overall change in lifestyle behavior uh, results in continued uh, health maintenance benefits. Um, and that uh, with a plant-rich diet, you know, you're going you're gonna to do a way better job of, of sort of getting in the, the sort of essential nutrients than you are with a, with a prototypic Western diet. Next slide, please. This was some really impressive research on cardiovascular disease. So the, this particular study took a whole bunch of people who, who needed angiography. So for anyone who's had sort of heart attack or what we would call unstable angina, sort of the near heart attack where they go in your arm with a wire and they go up into your heart to see what's clogged and how things are going. Um, regression of stenosis, stenosis meaning the clogging of those blood vessels or a process we call atherosclerosis. 82% of the patients that they put on a plant-rich diet achieved an improvement in their sort of clogging or stenosis by actual measurement of diameter at one year. The, this intervention group who was adherent to the plant-rich diet also achieved a 24 pound average weight loss and a 91% average reduction in angina frequency after a year. And again, angina is that symptom of chest pain with exertion. So you're okay at rest, but you go for a walk or you climb a set of stairs and you get that chest tightness or that chest pain. Next slide, please. Um, 77% of the patients that underwent the intervention avoided repeat procedure or repeat revascularization at the three-year mark. And this is really, really important because recurrence of symptoms of that angina is, is one of the most common causes for people needing recurrent intervention. So again, I mean, you know, it, it's, all, it's really important for us to eat this way to um, sort of prevent these types of events. But for anyone you know who is suffering from heart disease, you know, even if they've already needed intervention, if they can start to eat this way, they're going to significantly reduce their chances of needing any further medicalization downstream. Next slide, please. Diabetes, really significant results. People who eat uh, sort of less plants have a, have a significantly increased risk of type 2 diabetes. Research has shown that uh, eating a vegetarian diet, for example, long term, reduces the risk of developing type 2 diabetes by about 74% as compared to the typical sort of meat rich prototypic Western diet. Um, it, you know, it, eating this way really reduces your average blood sugars. 26 to 43% of people who eat plant-rich diets have been found in research to decrease their diabetes medication. So again, sort of that concept of not only preventing disease for those who have not yet become sick, but reversing disease for people who are already sick to some extent. So a really powerful concept. You know, we don't often talk about the opportunity for people with chronic disease to, to reverse their disease. You know, we often hear about sort of, we'll repeat your labs, adjust your medicines, we'll medicalize you along. But it's really important for people people who are already suffering to know that there is an opportunity for them to really change their trajectory, um, you know, in a way that's just as powerful as prescription medication. Next slide, please. 
bone and gut health. So again, eating a plant-rich diet protect, helps to protect against osteoporosis. And it also, when it comes to our guts, people are, are typically reporting reduced bloating, reduced constipation, reduced rates of heartburn and diarrhea. So for anyone who suffered from any of these symptoms or for the primary care people on the call, imagine one intervention to address all of that. Um, cancer prevention, you know, I want everyone to Google cancer and polyphenols, P-O-L-Y, P-H-E-N-O-L-S. Um, these are big complex molecules that are very much a part of the plant structure that are found to improve certain tumor sensitivities to chemotherapy and are starting to be recognized as a potential adjunct to cancer treatment. So if you know anyone, obviously, who wants to reduce their risk of developing cancer, but for anyone who's already been diagnosed with certain types of cancer and is undergoing treatment, think about talking to them about, about eating this way, really reducing their meat intake. Next slide, please mental health, which is huge. I mean, who on this call either has not struggled themselves or doesn't have a friend or family member, loved one who has struggled, um, reduced significantly reduced rates of depression and anxiety. And there are several proposed mechanisms for that. If you go to the, the next slide, we'll, we'll go through some of those. Um, so this was the SMILES randomized control trial, which talked about some of the clinical outcomes. So people with improved anxiety and depression scores who were adherent to plant-rich diets but, but the mechanism is really proposed to be, number one, a, a sort of a flourishing support of the microbiome. So we're learning more and more about the, the power of having all of the healthy bacteria in our gut um, and sort of the link that a healthy microbiome has with, with optimal mental health. Um, optimal neuronal membrane integrity. So sort of the membranes that surround our brain cells that obviously are responsible for how we think and regulating mood and sleep and reaction to circumstance, all of that kind of stuff. Those membranes are strengthened by eating this way and then production of neurotransmitters. So, you know, when we give people medicine for a mood disorder, we're often giving them medicines that increase, you know, the amount of serotonin or norepinephrine in the brain and eating this way can help to do that too. Next slide, please. So again, just highlighting these, these sort of you know, bodily processes that, that I just mentioned that, that sort of relate the plant-rich eating to mental health. Next slide, please. Alzheimer's and dementia. So, you know, I won't get sort of too into the sort of neurodegenerative, you know, sort of processes and the subcategories of dementia, but bottom line, the evidence is quite clear that you definitely can reduce your, your risk or the likelihood um, that you're going to develop dementia by eating this way. Um, and there are all sorts of reasons for that and the neuronal membrane sort of protection, that, that brain cell protection I did speak about earlier. Inflammatory reduction is huge. There is some suspicion that the proteins that tend to clog up, you know, the pathways in the brain that are responsible for the manifestations of Alzheimer's disease um, are, are potentially due to inflammation. So again, another example of the importance of, of eating this way to reduce the body's sort of inflammatory burden. And then also vascular dementia. A lot of people wind up developing cognitive impairment due to the clogging of the blood vessels. So as would be the case with the heart disease patients we talked about earlier and reversing that clogging or that atherosclerosis in the vessels, you know, you do that in the brain and you're going to be less likely to have a stroke, less likely to develop cognitive impairment and less likely to have a mood disorder. So you see the benefits in every organ system. Next slide, please low carbon care. So some of the physiologic benefits for the body that I just outlined, but why is this, why is this good for the planet? Next slide, please. So the Eat Lancet Commission right up there with cancer and polyphenols is some, something that I would get everyone to look up. Uh, sort of a global commission of government in the academic and not-for-profit institutional sector. 23 commissioners from 19 different countries and they came together to try and sort of establish what a food system by 2050 could look like. You know, by 2050, we're going to need to be able to feed 10 billion people, so sort of 20, 25% more people than we have on the planet right now in a way that is not only sustainable, if we, if we all, if all 10 billion of these people eat the way we do with our prototypic Western diet, we're doomed. So for all sorts of reasons, we have to change that. And which is why I'm so grateful that everyone is doing this kind of work. Um, and, uh, um, it, but it's also got to be beneficial for health. So as we feed all of these people, we need to be able to manufacture the food sustainably, but we also need to be able to eat in a way that, that sort of improves human health and reduces uh, the population's need for medical care. Next slide, please. 
animal agriculture is huge, and this was touched on previously, um, but animal agriculture is believed to account for 14.5% of all human-caused climate change, which is huge, and there are a whole bunch of reasons for that that I believe we get into on the next slide, please. So current livestock farming, we're talking about 70% of global surface and groundwater use. So the amount of land we have to use to raise cattle, for instance, and the amount of water, fresh water, that we have to consume to, to sort of, you know, make their feed and to, to hydrate them um, is sort of one of the leading drivers of, of the unsustainable food system impact on the planet. 80% of global agricultural land use. So, so much of the land clearing, you know, you read statistics like we lose a football field of rainforest, you know, how many times a day, I forget. I mean, oftentimes it is because of this, it's because of this global demand for cattle and for beef. 82% of all antibiotic use in Canada, which is just astonishing. You know, if climate change doesn't take us out downstream, antibiotic resistance might. You will find that the doctors of today are much more conservative with antibiotics than the doctors of yesteryear. We need to be much more careful um, in terms of how we use them. And we often think about it clinically in terms of how we use them in people. Is this really a pneumonia? Is that sore throat a virus or strep? Um, but, but, you know, ultimately, you know, the food industry is using them to a much greater proportion. And then 40% of global methane gas emissions, with Melinda, which Melinda captured earlier in terms of cattle and how they burp and toot and produce methane and all of that stuff. Next slide, please. So again, just a general depiction of how you can see up top animal sources of food uh, produce much more greenhouse gas per kilogram of food than the plant rich sources that you see at the bottom. So really, again, just thinking about, you know, not, not necessarily becoming vegan. We're not asking anyone to do that, but to really make meat a treat as I request of all of my patients. Next slide, please. So an action plan, how do we do this? This is a big ask, but, but there are ways to implement it slowly and iteratively in a way that doesn't need to shock you know, yourself, your fridge, your family, or your trip to the grocery store. Next slide, please. So some ideas to get you started. Add a vegetable to dinner. You know, we all start from different places. Like the classic sort of, you know, 1975 teaching of meat, starch, and veg really sort of is, is, is changing and has evolved to, a, to a, a way of eating that is much more plant rich. But if you're not eating any vegetables at all, please just consider buying a couple of different ones a week and adding them to your meal. Make a meatless meal with beans, nuts, seeds instead of meat, chicken, or fish. And what I'll sometimes do is ask a patient to try going vegan once once a week or try and be plant rich once a week because it really changes the way you start to think about food. I think being able to make a meal, particularly a lunch or a dinner without an animal source is important if it's something you've never done before. Um, but for all of the health benefits we, you know, we've reviewed this evening, I really would, would encourage everyone to consider it. Buy frozen vegetables to reduce food waste and incorporate more vegetables into your meals. Next slide, please. The power of plant protein. So again, there is this big myth. You know, I'll ask my patients, how much animal are you eating? And they'll say, you mean protein? And I'll say, no, look at a 200 foot, you know, sort of tree. I think there's no protein in that trunk. It's, um, we're talking about sort of uh, plant protein instead of animal protein. So the fact that you can't get, the fact that sort of there's, there's this thinking that you can't get protein from plants is a complete myth. Um, and it's really important that we start to sort of shift our focus to how we get more of our protein from plant sources. And, and um, Lisa did a great job earlier of reviewing how it is that we can get sort of protein from plants. So I would encourage everyone to, to give that a go and to think about, um, you know, how they could do a better job of that. Even if it's the post-workout kind of protein, pick a plant source instead. Next slide, please. So finally, I'll finish with sort of the quick review of Canada's food guide. Um, you know, despite huge pressure from the, the animal food lobby, Canada did a really good job at, at sort of conveying in its newest, most adapted version of the food guide that really we need very, very little animal, if any at all, um, to sort of achieve optimal health. So uh, again, I would encourage you to look at this diagram and to envision that sort of Mediterranean diet pyramid that was put up earlier to really think about, you know, this isn't about extremes, this isn't about going vegan, it is about ratios and it is about making progress relative to where you stand right now. So, um, you know, if everyone could just take a few minutes tonight to sort of think about their next trip to the grocery store, if this presentation has any impact on kind of what you wind up coming home with, um, I would be most grateful. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Brian. That was really great information. And, you know, the, he the evidence is, is hard to ignore that reducing meat consumption has such a huge impact on health overall and, and including our mental health. So uh, thank you so much for sharing. And I hope that everyone does take uh, some of those tips and thinks about that on their next shop uh, trip to the grocery store. I sure will, for sure. Um, I think we're going to be moving on to our next presenter, and um, that is going to be Dr. Katie Dorman. She's just going to share a few local resources that uh, people can uh, be aware of and, and utilize. Okay, thank you, Sarah, and thank you, everyone. That um, presentation reminded me um, why I follow a plant-based diet. Um, but we, so it can be, it can be hard to access, especially um, in certain parts of the city or with certain incomes available for food. It can be hard to access fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, we've located, or we've identified a few, oh, you can go to the next slide, a few local food banks that have, have uh, fresh produce. So one is Market Greens. And this is on every Wednesday, it's at 240 Wellesley, it's right beside the Food Basics there um, at 240 Wellesley. And you have, there's um, an option if you go online or stop by, you can sign up for Green RX. You don't need a proof of income. Um, and this is a way to access affordable produce. The um, other, you can go to the next slide. Another local food bank that is great right near our clinic, our, our clinics at St. Michael's Hospital is the Allen Gardens Food Bank. And this is actually open Thursday and Friday from 12.30 to 3 p.m. And it's located at the corner of Sherborne and Carleton. So the southeast corner of Sherborne and Carleton there. Um, and so this is another, another food bank you might, you might be able to access. Um, and what we're going to do is put a document in the chat that you can download and save a Word document. And we've compiled some resources um, because it's overwhelming. There's like a burst of research, very positive research on plant-based diets and, and uh, menus and recipes and patient and healthcare provider oriented resources. So we've, we've put together a few that we find useful. Um, and so in the Word document, you'll find some plant-based diet resources um, with respect to kind of the research and the health evidence there's plant-based data and plant-based Canada, um, and they both include physicians uh, and clinical and, and dietitians and clinical and non-clinical individuals who've compiled resources for you. Um, and in this Word document that we've, is it in the chat now? That will soon be in the chat. Um, we've also got Pulses, uh, the Whole Food Plant-Based Cooking Show, and Produce Made Simple. They're just three of many websites with plant-based food recipes for you. Uh, and we wanted to highlight a couple Toronto-based food justice organizations. You might be familiar with Food Share and African Food Basket. Um, and these are organizations that are doing really wonderful work in terms of um, food justice and food access um, with a kind of social justice, anti-racism lens. So uh, check them out if you're able to support these organizations. That's great. Um, and Food Share is, a, is another um, resource for kind of affordable local produce that you can look into online. So the, I see the word doc there now, so feel free to um, download it. So we can, I think that's it for the resources, but I'll check out the chat and if there's any questions about these resources, I can answer. That's great. Thank you so much, Katie. So um, that does conclude our webinar and that kind of moves us into our discussion um, part of the webinar. Now, our panelists have been answering your questions quite uh, vigorously over the session. So I'm just, there are a few questions that, you know, I'm going to take an opportunity just to read the answers and the panelists can jump in because um, you may not have had an opportunity to read these. Um, but uh, we had a question around which plants are complete protein sources. And so uh, this might be of interest to many. So uh, Lisa replied with complete protein means that food contain all nine essential amino acids, which are building blocks for protein. Uh, the only plant-based foods that have complete protein include quinoa and buckwheat, um, but you can combine several plant-based proteins and other plant-based foods to create a more complete protein. Um, 
a few other questions just around, you know, soy and is it safe and, you know, the end and, and choosing meat alternatives, uh, understanding that there are sodium uh, in some of these. So I think the, the take home message from some of our answers are, you know, it's really all about balance. Um, so looking at uh, trying to buy product, uh, products with, with lower sodium intake. Um, and as, you know, Brian had mentioned, it's not an all or nothing, you know, it's, it's to try to embed this into your daily routine, even small, small changes make a big difference. Um, I'm just curious if there's any uh, questions that one of our panelists answered that you think would be beneficial to uh, share uh, over this webinar. Just give a second for that. Um, a few people, there was also uh, one of our, uh, our participants, Margaret shared, you know, being vegan has helped lower her LDL. So, you know, that's really great. Uh, it's nice to have firsthand uh, experience from, from our participants. So thank you for sharing that. Um, we'll just leave, I think there's a few, um, let's just take a look. Oh, thank you, Melissa. Let's see, what do you think? Yeah, it's a great question. What do you think the federal government can do to facilitate a shift to plant-based diets? Um, do any of our panelists have a have any uh, any thoughts on this? Sarah, it's Brian. I'm happy to tackle that one if you want. Sure. I think it's a great question, and I did just see that in the chat a second ago. I think you know the two things that ultimately move the needle um, from an innovation standpoint tend to be policy and curriculum. And so what we need um, are sort of big policy frameworks that support um, all kinds of things from clinical guidelines for professionals. Like there's no reason that this shouldn't be as automatically prescribed as blood pressure medication. So, you know, the social prescribing frameworks and, and sort of clinical guidelines and ensuring that we're as, as sort of progressive and, and sort of open to all of the important forms of science possible. And then, and then curriculum. So from the time kids hit school in kindergarten, ensuring that adapted forms of teaching are there, but then to all of our health professionals, you know, this stuff hasn't penetrated medical school properly. And I think, um, you know, you, you could go on big tangents about, you know, potentially the, the over application of, of evidence-based medicine and the hierarchy of evidence and that sort of thing. But I think, you know, much more simply put, um, you know, this stuff needs to be in the curricula of, of all of the health profession educations from, you know, medical and dental students to physiotherapy and occupational therapy, registered dietitian, nutrition. Everyone needs to really be sort of pointing to the fact that food changes um, health trajectory for human beings and that it needs to be a core part of any comprehensive disease management plan. So that's what I would say, policy frameworks and, and curriculum. That's great. Thank you so much. And that's, that's, you know, that's part of uh, also why we are trying to provide education as well. So just to make sure that it's in the forefront of people's uh, knowledge and understanding. And so then we can turn that into action. So thank you so much. Um, there's a few more. I think there's some questions about the linked resources. So uh, they're, they're located in the chat. We will uh, send out a follow up to this webinar and we will include the recording. I do apologize. We uh, started the recording just a second uh, after our introduction, but all of the bulk of the content will be there. And then we will share more of the resources. I'm just going to take a minute to just review if there's any other questions we might be able to answer in our time frame. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, and thank you so much for um, all of your uh, positive remarks in the chat and the question and the Q and A. Um, I think there was a question, and I I, I wonder if um, one of our dietitians may have an answer on. Uh, advice for, for children and plant-based um, diets, uh, I, understanding, you know, that this is general health information. Yeah, I just mentioned that uh, it is perfectly safe for children to consume a plant-based diet or, or primarily plant-based diet. There are a couple of nutrients that you want to be a little bit mindful of, specifically iron, calcium, uh, getting enough healthy fats. Um, but definitely possible. It just requires perhaps a little bit more planning and, and um, being a bit more proactive. 
That's great. Thank you so much, Lisa. And um, I think it's also a great opportunity to highlight some of our team members in our family health team. If you are a patient of ours, um, you know, we do have really great uh, dietitians, as you've heard from. So um, if you are interested in some specific questions, you know, we encourage you to talk to your, your provider and they are able to to, um, to possibly link you with our dietitians who can provide more one-on-one -on -one counseling specifically for some of these questions related to, you know, uh, if you have particular dietary uh, concerns or restrictions or you're following something like a, like a fog map um, and how you can incorporate plant-based uh, diets into your, into your life, understanding that, you know, we are all uh, unique. So, um, I think if there's, I'm just going to give a quick moment to see, to scan the chat and see if any of our panelists have any final uh, thoughts or, or able to answer any other additional questions. Um, Sarah, I've, I've read um, some kind of concerns around the people who won't shift from a meat to a plant-based diet. That's come up several times in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, when we kind of hear of the kind of climate effects and health effects of plant-based diets, it can be daunting to think that there are people who won't follow this advice. Um, but I think that's why, as Dr. McKenna mentioned, the focus can be on reduction um, and we can shift. So even reducing, you know, to a one, as we said, one meat-free day a week can have a significant impact on health and, and on climate change. So there'll be people who take make a total shift to plant-based diets and there'll be some people who just reduce their meat consumption, but it all has a positive impact. Um, so if we work towards that goal of reduction, we will see we will see benefits um, at the society and individual level. Thank you, Katie. That's so great. Yeah, that's exactly what we wanted to share. And so um, I, I think we will uh, we will do our best to share these resources and we will we can uh, also look at some of the common questions that were uh, asked and include that in our information post this webinar. So uh, please look out for that. It usually takes us about a week to get that kind of organized. Um, that does, you know, conclude our uh, three-part webinar series this year. Uh, we do thank everyone who has attended and um, we are going to be looking at sending out a survey just to get some feedback. Um, so please look out for that in the future. Um, I think, I think with that, we will, uh, maybe Anne will just jump to our thank yous and um, I hope everyone has uh, a great evening.